Let's go. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership of the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our Space Forum this evening. Uh, through the glass ceiling to the stars, a conversation with Colonel Eileen Collins and with special guest Jonathan Ward. So we've got a great presentation for you. Uh, it's really glad that uh, you're joining us. I know it has been about four weeks since we had our last space forum. We had some scheduling changes. So we're glad to get back on track and I'll give you an update on the upcoming schedule as well as we move into the program. Here's our agenda for this evening. I always like to go over some of our virtual etiquette, a few NSS announcements, the upcoming space forums and town halls. We'll get right into our program. Uh, and then we're gonna close actually with uh, giving out our webinar door prizes. So uh, look forward for that. Uh, and uh, let's get right into things in terms of our virtual etiquette. You all know this routine. Uh, if you have a question, it's best to submit the question using the Q&A function. That way it goes right to the panelists. There's no mixture with all the other stuff that goes into the chat function. So try to use the Q&A, it'll work a little bit better. Now you can use the chat function to comment. Uh, everybody can see that. So I ask everybody to be respectful of the panelists and the audience. And also it's best to view the session in speaker mode so you can see who actually is talking at that time. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what is new with uh, NSS. We've got a couple of new things starting. One is our NSS Career Center, and it's gonna be launched very soon. Uh, we're working with a, another group that handles this, uh, and it's really gonna uh, change how we do things, putting jobs out there that connects uh, talent, like they say, with opportunity. So look for an announcement about that. We're really excited about the launch. Also, we have a new benefit called uh, Access to the New Space Journal. This is a, a journal for space entrepreneurs. Uh, you can get access to this online through inside NSS, uh, I'm sorry, inside uh, nss.org uh, and you have complete access. So uh, check those out. Uh, for those of you that are not members, it's easy to join. Go to, to space.nss.org slash join if you'd like to get advantage of these benefits. And also make sure you just check out our NSS website, space.nss.org. And also, I always like to say, if you believe in our cause, and I think most of you do, uh, please donate. Go.nss.org slash donate dash now, and I'll put that into the chat. Uh, your donations, your contributions, your support, and your membership make programs like this possible. So we thank you uh, and appreciate all you do for NSS. Finally, at the end of the session, I just asked that everybody complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes. Uh, you'll get it there once you exit. It's anonymous and your feedback has really been helpful in planning future events and making sure we're offering programs that add value to you. So thank you in advance for doing that. Upcoming now, just to look at where we are, uh, next week, we're gonna be doing one on the 28th. It's called Farming in Space for Future Space Settlements, not just glop and salad. So that's an interesting title with Bryce Meyer, who's a member of our board of directors. Looks like a really interesting uh, presentation. One week after that, we've mentioned before the prize winners of our NSS MRs uh, 2021 contest. And also it kind of aligns with our presentation next week of food and nutrition plan for space flight to Mars. We've got two really talented students who will be presenting their winning papers and also one of NASA's principal investigators in this area. So look forward to that. And then we do hope to close things out in December December with a year in review. We've got a number of activities uh, internally to NSS in November and with Thanksgiving, we're probably going to not have another program until December. So look for those announcements as we move forward. So thank you for allowing me to present a few updates on NSS. It's now time to get into our program. And 
First, I, it's an honor and privilege for me uh, to introduce uh, two of my volunteer colleagues. As I've said before, NSS is a volunteer-led organization, incredibly talented and dedicated people. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Anita Gale. Anita is our CEO and chair of the executive committee. And then Michelle Hanlon, who is our NSS president. So I'm gonna first turn it over to Anita. So I'll stop sharing and then I'll turn it over to Michelle. So uh, these space forums are one of our favorite NSS benefits. Uh, NSS leaders just love that, uh, that Bert and Larry started this. And it's, it's a real treat that Eileen is joining us tonight. So thank you so much, Eileen. I, I mentioned as we were chatting beforehand, Eileen and I have crossed paths before and she probably doesn't remember. Somewhere, Eileen, in your vast collection of accolades, you have something from Society of Women Engineers called the Resnick Challenger Medal. And you were not able to come, and that was awarded to you shortly after SDS 114. You were not able to come to the Society of Women Engineers Conference that year. So um, you and I got together with a videographer and we pre recorded my presentation and your acceptance of the Resnick Challenger Medal, which is for extraordinary achievements by women in aerospace. And these are achievements that have lasting impact toward uh, human activities in space. So. It's a delight to see you again and really looking forward to your presentation tonight. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you so much, Anita. And I'll turn it, oh, Eileen, uh, did you wanna say something there? I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to turn it over now to our NSS president, uh, Michelle Hanlon. Michelle? Hi, uh, thanks. Sir. Thank you, Bert. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I um, I just want to say it's it's just a, such an honor to be the president of this um, National Space Society. It's an amazing organization. Um, we are truly citizens of space, and we are really working very hard to make sure that space is democratized and also that we all have the same opportunities to go and live and work in space. Um, I thank you to Bert and Larry and Fred for putting these together. Um, thank you, um, Colonel Collins, you uh, for making the time to meet with us and our members and our, our extended family. Um, you know, we our entire the entire foundation of National Space Society is based on people like Neil and Buzz and, and incredible individuals like yourself who have shown us that we can get to space and that we can explore space. And we really look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives on what has been an incredibly active year in space this year. So thank you again for joining us. I know nobody else wants to hear more from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Let me go back to sharing my screen and we'll get right into the, the meat of our program tonight. So it is my pleasure right now to introduce another one of my colleagues, uh, Dave Dressler, uh, who is gonna moderate uh, our uh, session this evening. And so, uh, Dave, I'm going to let you uh, introduce our guest speakers tonight. It's all yours. Thank you, Bert. This is a huge uh, honor. Eileen, we got to know you at uh, ISTC in 2019, our last live conference. And what an inspiration you are to young women and girls all over the planet. And thank you for this opportunity for being able to bring this uh, back around and do this virtual conference. We'll be airing this on YouTube for the people that aren't able to see it tonight, but uh, I think we'll get a lot of uh, interest and hopefully, you know, this this video will go through high schools and uh, you know colleges and and uh, you'll you'll be able to tell them how you were able to accomplish what you have been. And uh, Jonathan, thank you for joining us. You've written some fabulous books. I look forward to reading them. I think many members of our Space Society will enjoy them as well because. You get into the nuts and bolts of uh, Saturn V and have written articles on uh, Challenger or, or uh, books, basically whole books that really get into specific detail. And our people just eat that stuff up. So I think uh, we're going to do some book reviews and we'll get those out for Eileen's book as well as your, your other books. And Eileen, so why, why did you decide now to write this book? What was your inspiration? Oh, well, thanks for asking, Dave. First of all, I want to I want to say it wouldn't happen without Jonathan. So, and as you just mentioned, he's written he's written two books on Apollo. He, he wrote Bringing Columbia Home, which is a story of uh, finding Columbia after the tragic accident in two thousand and three. That was when I got to know him, and 
the, I wrote the epilogue for his book on bringing Columbia home. And as the years went by, he asked me if we wanted to write a book together and it was shortly before the pandemic. And of course I was busy and I really didn't think I had time. But when the pandemic hit, I started rethinking it. That now that my travel has canceled and I have a little bit more free time, um, I said yes. And we started writing in the spring of 2020. And like I said, it wouldn't happen, it wouldn't happen without him. But over the years, many people have asked me, where's your book? We'd like to read, you know, about your space missions, you know, about how do you become a test pilot? What is it like to fly in the Air Force? So the book is really memoirs. It's from, you know, how as a child, how I decided that I was interested in flying, how I was interested in space exploration, which I always have been fascinated with space exploration, all the way through um, to my last mission and my retirement. So that's kind of what the book covers. Yeah, excellent. And, and Jonathan, what was your interaction like uh, with Eileen and putting this book together? It was, uh, I, I would just have to say, it was just a fabulous experience. Uh, as, as Eileen mentioned, the, uh, the pandemic, as horrible as it's been for so many families, and uh, you know, a lot of us have lost friends, and uh, it, it's been horrible for the economy, for people's jobs and everything. But it gave us something that um, those of us who reach a certain age begin to realize that uh, the most precious commodity is time. And uh, Eileen and I both found ourselves with some gaps in our schedules that would not normally have happened had we been doing other kinds of work. And uh, I say that advisedly about Eileen having gaps in her schedule because she was still on four boards. And uh, it was an interesting experience to try to make sure we could find time to, to work with each other. But uh, we did it entirely virtually. We never got a chance to see each other after we started working on the book. I think we didn't catch up with each other until Space Fest uh, earlier in the summer this year. Oh, so that that's cool. You've been to Space Fest. Uh, that that's quite an amazing event, isn't it? You uh, get get rid of a few boxes of books. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, the book wasn't ready at that point, but uh, we everybody was wondering where it was for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it, it just came out on the nineteenth, uh, basically uh, two days ago. And uh, Eileen, tell us what happened as soon as your book came out. Oh, <laughs> well, the book was officially published on the 19th, which was Tuesday of this week, but we got notice that it was showing up in bookstores over the weekend, and I started getting text messages. Um, even Jonathan sent me a picture of him at Barnes & Noble's, like, look, here's our book. It was all the way up on the top and the left at Barnes & Noble in the new release uh, nonfiction section, and I thought, whoa, so I ran over to our Barnes & Noble, and there was the book, so it came out early. I'm not sure why. I wasn't totally prepared, but people have been texting me and emailing me all week, and they're, you know, asking me, can I mail these books to you for you to sign? And I guess I'm going to have to find out a way to, to uh, work with that. But I'm, it, it's really great to see uh, Jonathan emailed me yesterday and said we went number one on the Amazon Space Science and Astrophysics list and then we also went to number one on aviation history in the new release category so we'll see how it does in the long run but but i really it, it's not that we want to uh it's not that we really want quantity but we really want quality we when when people read the book we want them to say that they learned something i hope that young people read the book and say gee i think i'd like to work in the space industry someday or maybe i do want to get that degree in stem because I can do some of these exciting things. And so, you know, I'm hoping that we really reach a lot of young people, high school, college age uh, students, and inspire them to, to reach for the stars, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in the beginning, what was your inspiration that put you on the career path that allowed you to make all these fabulous breakthroughs? Well, you know, I would have to say the Gemini astronauts were my first inspiration. And I've told, some of you may have heard the story before, but I was, I was in my fourth grade class. And I know Jonathan's heard this many times, but my teacher was Mrs. Whitmarsh. So I, I love teachers. I still remember uh, my teacher. And I had this junior scholastic magazine and in there was an article on the Gemini astronauts. And I wanted to be one of them. And the other thing 
Yeah, oh, by the way, I read about their backgrounds and they were in the military, they were test pilots. And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a pilot and then I'm going to be an astronaut. And I think I was nine years old. And but realized I had also been as a kid, I was also watching these crazy TV shows like Buck Rogers, because for some reason, I just loved science fiction. And I loved learning about the future. So one other thing about that magazine, Junior Scholastic, was right after the article on the Gemini astronauts was an article on should the United States be going into space, pro, con. And this is a kid's magazine, right? Well, if, if for those of us that were around in the 60s, you remember there was a big controversy over whether our country should be spending money in space because we had the Vietnam War going on and there was um, uh, civil rights demonstrations going on. And we had a lot of issues here on earth that were higher priority is what the con side was saying. But I'm a little kid looking at this saying, well, of course we should go into space. You know, why can't we do both? And I remember not understanding why there would be a pro versus con. And I think I was about nine years old. And ever since then, I've been, you know, I think a, a big proponent of space travel. And I, I believe that by traveling into space, it can really help solve these big problems that we have on earth because they, they bring us together and it gives us, I would say, higher goals to shoot for and, and make us realize that we're kind of all in this together. Yeah, I remember going into school gymnasiums and watching a little black and white TV on a cart and watching those uh, Gemini launches. It was quite inspirational. John, Jonathan, what was your uh, what was your lead into uh, writing about space adventures? And well, you know, one thing that that was interesting for Eileen and me is we're both almost exactly the same age. I'm I'm 55 days older than she is, so uh, okay. she's. Uh, we both grew up in the same era and, you know, I just devoured the life magazine. Uh, you know, every time there was a Gemini mission, you get, the, you get the life magazine with those big full color uh, page spreads of, of the photos. And I would just, uh, you know, go nuts trying to, to figure out all of uh, what was going on in those pictures. And so I, I've always been interested in it. One of the very first memories I had was going out to see the echo satellite go overhead. That was, you know, the big Mylar balloon that was like uh, 100 feet in diameter. I remember my parents taking me outside to, to show me that like in 1961 or something like that. So it's always been an area of fascination for me. And um, I did get to work very briefly on the space program back in the 1980s. I worked uh, on the Space Station Freedom Program as a contracts manager. I wasn't bending any metal or doing or putting anybody up into space, but I was part of the bureaucracy that eventually led to the uh, the construction of the International Space Station, but uh, it's been it's been wonderful in the last uh, twenty years or so to be able to reconnect with that and get to pe meet people like Eileen and uh, so many of the uh, other members of the the National Space Society. So, Jonathan, what did you learn about uh, Colonel Collins by writing this book that you didn't know before you wrote started writing it? I've got to say that basically everything about her before nineteen ninety, I did not know anything about. Um, you know, I, I, I learned about her through reading about her as she was an astronaut, but I knew really very little about her, her um, Air Force career and all the firsts that she said as an Air Force pilot. I mean, there, there's, there's a whole book there on her Air Force career and the, and the groundbreaking work she did in that too, uh, that she was able to do that both for the Air Force and for NASA. It was just an amazing, um, an amazing thing. And it's great to be able to see those stories come together in this book. Hmm. Well, on that note, Eileen, what advice have you passed along to other women pilots who followed you in the Air Force? So we, so Air Force pilots, you know, we, we support each other in our career. And, you know, the, there's actually an organization um, for women military aviators, which includes the Army, the Navy, and the Coast Guard, and the Marines, and uh, obviously the Air Force. I was one of the charter members of that organization. And we, there were so few of us back in the, I think it was 1986, maybe when we started that organization. And there were so few women in the military flying in those days that we thought, you know, there were issues with the women. I mean, everything from, uh, you know, what your flight suits look like to, I mean, promotions and it was kind of a way for us to bond. And that organization still exists today. I'm still a member of it. But I do want to say, you know, for, for the women that first came into the uh, 
current military. So it was 1974 that the Navy first brought in women pilots. And it was 1976 that the Air Force first brought in women pilots. I came in in 1978. Even two years after the Air Force started, it was still a test program. And I was also in the first group that went through pilot training at my base. And that was Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma. And there were four of us in that, in that class. And there were about 500 pilots on the base. So we really stood out. And it was important for us to be the best that we could be because we were in a test program to prove can women fly in the military. And so for each one of us, we had to work very hard to be the best pilot we could be. Turned out in the long run, all these years later, we, we see that, you know, the women fly, you know, as far as the grades that you get in pilot training and the graduation rate, and then you success later in your operational career, the women do pre pretty much the same as the men is when you look at the groups as a whole. So the program was successful. And one other thing I want to I mention is we stand on the shoulders of those that went before us. So there were two groups of women that I should mention before us. And one of them was the Women Air Force Service Pilots that ferried aircraft during World War II. And then there were the Mercury 13 women. Uh, they were actually called the Mercury 13 many years later, but in 1961, they went through the NASA medical uh, challenges and the medical testing to see if they had the physical and mental and emotional stamina to be in space. And the women did very well. In, in fact, I think there were 25 that started and there were 13 that passed all of these tests and they uh, later named themselves the Mercury 13. So we really stand on their shoulders from you know the, uh, the first women in uh, Air Force pilot training to the first women mission specialists that flew in the space shuttle beginning in 1978. They really set a, a good foundation for my generation when we had our opportunity to go. So my, I always thank them. I think it's important that we thank them and recognize them because they don't always get remembered. Mm. Yeah. And I'm thinking going forward, um, it's almost more efficient for women to go on long duration missions than men because they don't consume as much. And the teamwork's probably more collaborative. I, you, you expressed some views on that earlier. Would you like to share more about that aspect? Well, you know, I don't actually say that women are better than men or men are better than women when it comes to space flight. You know, I think that everybody contributes their own individual uh, talents. So, you know, I think maybe the jury is still out as to, you know, is, is there an answer to that question? But I'm not sure that it would be helpful to try to figure that out. I think what NASA does right now is try to pick the best people and we do try to pick diverse groups of people um, because we do want to make sure that uh, we get the best talent from uh, across the country and then other countries do select their own astronauts and send them in many cases to NASA to join the NASA program. So I think uh, it, you talk about size and how much you consume, you know, back during the Mercury days, you had to be below a certain height. I can't remember if it was five, six or five, seven. I mean, uh, some of you may remember what it was, but you had to be small because you had to fit in the capsule. And they made the case that the less you weighed and the smaller you were, the more beneficial that was for space flight. But, you know, I mean, in that case, were we discriminating against someone who might be six foot, <laughs> six foot tall? So I guess I think it's, I don't like to see restrictions. And oh, by the way, one other important thing there is the medical testing. So back in the early days, and even when I applied, you had to be in tip top, perfect medical condition. And there were all kinds of things as you went through your, your uh, interview week and they did all the medical testing it was a tough time because there were a lot of things that would disqualify you. Everything from like your eyesight to your hearing, or maybe there's a chamber in your heart that isn't beating right, or you know you just might have some something wrong with you. And a lot of the applicants were worried about that. But I think as the years go by, you see that NASA is now accepting more and more of these maybe quirks. Uh, like you don't have to have perfect 2020 vision. Um, I think they allowed up to 2100 when I applied, as long as it was corrected down to 2020. And so I think that as the years go by, we're not going to be quite as strict on 
you know, the, the, you know, this narrow definition of what an astronaut should be. We need to allow more people to have the opportunity to fly. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in your case, being a test pilot, I, I don't know, would you say it was kind of a shoe in or how competitive was it at that point when you were making the transition from Air Force to NASA? Yeah. So back in the shuttle days, the astronauts were defined two ways. You had pilots and you had mission specialists. Now today, they're just astronauts because we have the space station and now everyone is qualified, uh, well, I, say, I shouldn't say qualified, everyone is eligible to be a commander, for example. But back in the shuttle days, you had to be a pilot. Only, the, only those that started as pilots were eligible to be commanders because it was a, it was a, a flight test uh, spacecraft. So your question on the test pilot, the, I, I am very uh, happy. I, I didn't spend a lot of time as a test pilot, but I'm very happy with the time that I had because I really understood the flight test um, portion of the space shuttle as far as understanding the language of flight test and understanding uh, you know, some of the testing that we did. For example, on my first flight, we were doing a test of the first time the space shuttle rendezvoused with the Russian space station Mir. And we had a test plan to check out the flying qualities, the navigation equipment, the communication equipment. And I believe that my experience as a test pilot was very helpful as we trained and developed for that flight. Um, nowadays, NASA is still um, interested in hiring test pilots. There's not as much flying. More, there's uh, so much more automation in the new spacecraft today. In fact, Blue Origin is totally automated. Um, Virgin Galactic is still hand flown by the pilots. I know SpaceX is mostly automated. So pilots are a little bit, you know, the person that sits in the pilot seat doesn't really have to be a pilot nowadays because the, because the technology is so much more advanced and so much more is done automated. But I do believe that my test pilot experience by far, quali I, it was by far very important that I had that experience back in the space shuttle. Uh, space shuttle days. Yeah, and you, you had to fly the shuttle back, you know, take control of the stick, right? Is it's dropping like a brick through the atmosphere? That had to be fascinating. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, um, every space shuttle has been landed by the commander. Um, all, every, every mission. So the pilot gets a little bit of stick time, but um, up and away above, you know, around 50,000 feet or so, the pilot gets a little experience with, you know, maybe do a couple of um, inputs in the lateral axis and a couple inputs in the pitch axis, but then the commander uh, took control back and flew it down around the heading alignment cone in landing it. We tried to do a couple of uh, autopilot landings. There was one that was STS-3. You might remember they got into this pilot-induced oscillation um, because the commander didn't like what the Autoland system was doing, so he took over manual and he ended up getting into one of these PIOs. He recovered from it and landed safely. And then after Challenger, we tried to do another auto land. Now, why would we do that? Well, we wanted to be able to bring the shuttle back possibly um, if the weather was bad, you know, maybe it was so cloudy that you couldn't see the runway. Hmm. So we're doing this auto land test and it, right in the last month of training, the commander said, we're done. We're not gonna test this auto land system because it was just not a very good system to begin with. The technology wasn't quite there yet. Um, today's technologies are a lot better, um, but but the space shuttle was, you know, was very versatile. I say it was. The space shuttle was three things. You know, on launch it was a rocket. In in orbit it's a satellite, and on entry, it's an airplane. Maybe you could say a glider type of airplane. We never hand flew the shuttle on launch. It could have been hand flown on launch, but it was much more efficient to have the autopilot and the computers run that because you're in a very narrow flight envelope. On orbit, we hand flew all of our rendezvous. And I mean, you would use the autopilot for attitude control, but as far as your um, XYZ axes, that was all hand flown. And the entry was flown on autopilot until 50,000 feet, and then it was hand flown. So I would say that, you know, the, the, the space shuttle was very, very versatile and we learned so much on, you know, not just space flight, but how that spacecraft, the space shuttle itself interacted with its environment. 
So in what, what do we fly? 135 space shuttle flights. It was still very much a test uh, test program, even when we retired the shuttle. One of the things, if I can jump in for a second, one of the things yeah, I sure. really enjoyed about working with this, the book with Eileen was, you know, not only is she talking about her own history, you know, of her career, but there's a whole lot of looking behind the scenes that I never knew about. She, she talked about what it was like to fly the shuttle training aircraft. And, you know, to, to qualify as a pilot for a space shuttle, that's just to sit in the right seat. You had to fly 500 approaches and landing uh, simulations. To qualify as a commander, you had to fly a thousand of them. And they got, you, you were talking about the, the, the test pilot things. They would get a printout as they flew and, you know, and stop or actually didn't stop, but, but got down within a few feet of the runway and then take off again. They would immediately get a printout with all the inputs they'd given and what happened go around, go back up to altitude, come back down and try it again and learn from that. And so the test pilot uh, type of training really uh, factored into that uh, uh, approach and landing uh, testing that they did as part of their training. It was just fascinating to be able to hear things like that from Eileen, which I'd never heard from anybody else before. Yeah, there were simulators and didn't you use actual aircraft for simulating the landing as well? So we had three simulators that we used for landing. One of them was the motion base. Well, we actually had I say simulator. We had a motion base and a fixed base, which were on the ground there at Johnson Space Center. You could land those. They were kind of low fidelity, but you could still land them. Then we had a simulator out in Ames, out on the West Coast, that you could fly. And then we had what you're looking at here, which was the it's a Gulfstream two but it was modified to fly exactly like the space shuttle. So in the left seat was the instructor and he had a, I'm sorry, he was in the right seat. The instructor was in the right seat. He had the traditional Gulfstream two controls. And in the left seat was the astronaut who was going through uh, the training maneuvers. And you could see often we would suit up in that, uh, we call them pumpkin suits, but we'd suit up in that pressure suit and it would get pretty hot, but that's what you are returning from space in. So you train like you fly. So we would uh, wear those and the uh, instructor would fly the airplane up to uh, the first approach would start at 50,000 feet. He would engage the autopilot. He'd put out the thrust reversers in the engines, uh, drop the speed brakes and the flaps, turn the airplane over to the left seat and I would fly it down to uh, landing and fly the head in alignment cone. And there was so much training that took place. You had to adjust for things like the wind. You had to adjust, um, the altitude is different from between Edwards and uh, Northrop, which is uh, out in New Mexico, the White Sands and in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. And then you would also, you could also adjust for the weight of the shuttle and the center of gravity. And the controls would actually feel quite different when the center of gravity shifted from forward, uh, which is one of the uh, space station flights that I flew had a very forward center of gravity. And then the Chandra mission that I flew had a very aft center of gravity. And you could feel the difference in the pitch axes. Not much difference between orbiters. The big difference was in your weight and center of gravity as to how, how the uh, controls would feel. And one other interesting thing about flying the STA, the shuttle training aircraft, we would fly about 12 approaches on each flight, but we never actually touched down. We didn't do an actual touch and go. And the reason is the sitting height in the space shuttle was 32 feet. So when you land the space shuttle, your eye height was 32 feet over the runway. So the um, sitting height in the Gulfstream 2 is 25 feet. So the seven foot difference was accounted for when you actually did the quote fake touchdown when you hit seven feet above the runway you would hear a click in your ear and that would say oh you just touched down and that's how we i want to say modeled the difference between the eye height in the sta from the actual space shuttle and it was a great trainer because when i landed my first space shuttle i was very confident and i felt that i mean there were a few differences but i felt that i was very well prepared in those simulations, did they throw uh, threats at you or situations where you had to react? Uh, what was that like? Yeah, so we did. So we didn't actually do that in the airplane. And probably part of that was for safety. 
and we didn't really have the capability to do, but there were some minor things that we could adjust. For example, um, we could, uh, depending on where you were, you would have uh, various crosswinds, okay? And then you, uh, you could uh, assume that, let's say I was flying the Chandra mission, we could simulate an uh, RTLS, which is a return to landing site. So let's say I'm, uh, we were supposed to deploy the Chandra, but let's say there was a problem and we had to bring the Chandra back home. The shuttle actually felt quite different landing when you're that heavy with that much of an aft center of gravity. So I would train for those. Mm. But then when you're in the ground simulators at Johnson Space Center, that's when they would throw all the malfunctions at you. Okay. So, you know, with things, you know, you just have everything broken and you would have to make adjustments. But I think for the landing, the big, the big ones were crosswinds, headwinds, tailwinds, uh, different pressure altitudes, and maybe you blow a tire or something like that, have some kind of malfunction. And that Chandra was the heaviest payload ever, right, for the shuttle? That's what I'm told. <laughs> the space shuttle flew some classified missions, so I don't know anything about them. But Chandra was the heaviest payload that was unclassified that we ever flew. And, you know, af actually right off the top of my head, I can't tell you what, what the weight was. I think I forgot. But there was the, the telescope itself weighed 12,500. But we had a booster that was attached to it that weighed more than that. And I mean, it might have been almost as, I hate to give you a number because it might be wrong, but it was not only heavy, but it was, it was far aft because the, the booster, which was an IUS and inertial upper stage that was all the way in the back. And it had very, very small clearance. And I remember when uh, John Young was, uh, you, know, you may know John Young, there's, okay, there's a photo of the Chandra. If you look all the way down at the bottom there, you can see where it says USA on that white cylinder, that's the IUS. And that was built by Boeing and for me, and it's a solid, it's a solid booster. And for many, many years that IUS was used to boost the TDRS, which is a tracking data relay satellite that uh, this, the shuttle launched several of those before the Challenger. And I think we launched maybe one of them post Challenger. And then my flight, this, this one here in 1999 was the last flight of an IUS on a space shuttle. Um, by the way, this photo is an actual picture of the inside of Columbia. So we, we flew the Columbia orbiter in 1999 with Chandra and right in the, um, so I mentioned the IOS at the bottom, but then if you see that goldish area in the middle and then as it goes up, you see the silver, it looks like a, like a long cone. So that is the uh, Chandra X-ray observatory. And then at the very top of the picture, you can see those two black, they look like they're ovals, but they're actually the windows in the back of the, oh, okay, somebody's got a pointer, thank you. Yeah. And so those two windows there are what we were looking out when we did all the procedures to check out Chandra. We tilted it up to I, you know, a certain angle. We did more checkout, then we tilted it up to, I think it might've been about 50 degrees or so. Yeah, that, that's our view out the back window. You can see the aft of the shuttle. You can see the, the stubby wings sticking out on the right and left. And that long cylinder in the middle of our payload bay is, uh, is Chandra. And it, it was quite a responsibility to take up that telescope. I mean, people had been working on that for decades. And it, I was told it was $2 billion, but it was actually worth more than that because it's one of a kind. And we didn't want to make a mistake. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we took very good care of it. And, and by the way, Chandra was launched in 1999. It had a five-year mission. That uh, telescope was built, observatory, I want to say, was built and certified for five years. So it has been going now over 20 years and it's still going strong. It's in excellent condition. They have a website. If you're interested in X-ray astronomy, you can go uh, follow their science. Uh, Jonathan, what, what was some of the key uh, takeaways you, you learned about Chandra and, and that mission? Uh, again, it was one of those things, realizing how heavy that was uh, and what a risk that posed to the shuttle if you had to come back with that. Uh, you know, I was talking with uh, one of the, the people I got to interview for, for the, uh, the book was Steve Hawley, who was the astronomer that flew uh, along on the mission. And he was just talking about uh, uh, the, the, the real challenges that Eileen was facing with if they were going to have to bring that, uh, 
that telescope back again. Uh, you know, there were there were concerns about where the where the landing where, was the landing gear going to be able to handle a uh, a hard touchdown. I, what Eileen, you had to certify that you wouldn't bring it down more than a certain number of feet per second or something like that if there was an emergency aboard. And I I don't know how you could possibly certify. You know, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to drop out of the sky with this thing. Uh, no, I told him no, I couldn't do that. I said you have to. I'm, I think we, I think we were certified for six foot per second decent rate, and uh, they wanted me to guarantee I do it in less than two or something like that. I said no, that's not what we train for, so I can't go against the the training rules. But Jonathan, tell them about the leak. The leak yeah. that we had going. I'm the heaviest, the heaviest payload, and of all missions to have a leak, that was the, that was the oh. wrong one. Yeah. This was, uh, yeah, this was, I, I think this was probably the closest to a launch uh, disaster that we'd had other than, other than Challenger. Um, you know, I, I, Eileen, I guess maybe we'd just talk about it. I mean, the first five seconds after everything lifts off, everything looks like it's going fine. And before the, the space shuttle even begins rolling, you get, a, you get an alert that goes off in the, in the cabin. Yeah, we had an electrical short. We had two major problems on that Chandra launch. And this is summer of 1999. There was a lot of hoop de doo going on down at the Cape because it was the first woman commander, you know, which I was actually not part of because I was in quarantine. But all these people were there, like the women's soccer team was there that had just won the World Cup. And then the, the three Apollo 11 astronauts were there because it was their reunion. July 20th, 1999 was their 20... I do, yeah, their 20 year reunion. So they were all there. And then there were, I mean, all kinds of um, politicians and distinguished visitors. Again, I'm in quarantine, so I'm isolated from all this stuff. And you've, but, had, and you've had two uh, two scrubs already before the, uh, the actual launch attempt too. We had two scrubs. I remember it was a tragedy that um, JFK Jr. had crashed his airplane and he, he died along with his wife and his is I think it was his wife's sister was on it. That was going on like shortly before we launched. So there was, there was a lot going on, but we, um, we had two scrubs. I won't go into those due to time, but, but the actual launch itself, five seconds after liftoff, we had an electrical short. It was AC one phase a bus dropped out, but it only dropped out momentarily, but it was enough to fail two controllers on two separate engines. The engines kept running because they had backup controllers but we got an alert in the cockpit because one of our pumps had fallen below its uh, the, the speed where the alert is set. And we had radio calls going, we had to throw a couple switches. So we were then looking at, okay, what components have we lost with this AC1 phase eight, which by the way, came back. So some components came back, some didn't. Meanwhile, we have a leak that the crew did not know about, but there was a pin in the right engine that popped out when the engines lit and it hit the cooling tubes on the uh the side of the engine so okay so there's a close-up picture of it on the right um on the left you can see the right engine you can see the area where when the when those pins came out of the ejector plate well there were a couple that came out but one of them hit the side of the engine now those tubes actually have very super cold liquid hydrogen running through them and they thermally condition the engines well with that opening in the tubes we started leaking hydrogen so all the way up to orbit we are leaking hydrogen the crew was unaware we could not see it on our displays but mission control could see it they if you listen to the tape which in, in fact in the book there's a, a link to the youtube video that will will play actually what was going on in mission control at this time period, but the engine, the uh, flight controller said the tags are off. The tags are off, which, which they're there. It's just their, I want to say their lingo that something was wrong with the data. The temperature and pressures were not right. Well, we were leaking and it wasn't all that easy for them to figure it out until later in the ascent. What happened at the very end was we had something called a LOX low level cutoff. LOX meaning liquid oxygen. So we're leaking hydrogen, but we're also the hydrogen is mixing with oxygen, so that's getting sucked out at a faster rate. There's four sensors in the fuel tank. When they each get a, a sensation, an indication that they are out of fuel, they send a command to shut the engine, all three engines down. And that's what happened. It's called a LOX low level 
cut. It's only happened twice in the history of the shuttle program. Our mission was the second one. And that's a safety feature that's in the software because if you run out of fuel and you suck air into the engines, they're, all of them are going to explode. So they have to be shut down by the computer if they get low on gas. And then all the valves will move in the right direction to keep the, you know, the shutdown safe. So we were unaware of this. It, uh, once we got to Miko main engine cutoff, we saw that the little indicator on our software display cut off slightly early. And the Capcom called that we had a 15 foot per second underspeed, which uh, in the simulator, we sometimes have up to five, maybe as many as seven feet per second due to maybe a miscalculation or something like that. But 15 was way too high. So we thought, hmm, I wonder what caused that. And so these photos were sent to us before uh, we went to bed. Uh, actually, we, we launched the Chandra from the shuttle. And then before we went to bed that night, our flight director sent these photos to us. And we thought, wow, boy, we, we had a close call there. And, but we, as a crew, if we, we'll talk about it when we get back, we had to get on with the rest of our mission. But the uh, shuttle was grounded after this flight. And it, it was uh, grounded, first of all, because of the electrical short and all of the wiring had to be inspected in all four of the orbiters. And you can see in this, uh, okay, you've got a, a wide angle view on the left, but on the right, you can see the wire bundle. And there was a screw head that was near that and all the vibration at liftoff caused the uh, insulation to be slightly worn out, which is what caused the short. So the shuttle program grounded everything. They did the inspections and they got the shuttles uh, re-cleared to go fly again. And that, that was a major uh, showstopper in the middle of the shuttle program. The other, the other malfunction I talked about with the engine, those phase two engines were never flown again. They upgraded to something called block one engines. I don't wanna get too technical. I might lose some of the audience here, but th that's really all I wanna say about it. And we had to be reminded over and over again, you know, the space shuttle was, uh, I mean, it was a fantastic flying machine, but flying in space is still risky. And things will happen as you interact with the, with the environment, things will happen that maybe you didn't predict. By the way, that photo that just went up was the first light of Chandra. So in August of 99, the first image they took was of, I believe that was Sagittarius. Jonathan, maybe you can help me. With this. That's the uh, no. But that was that was the uh, first light. That is an X-ray image. Wow! I, I believe it was Sagittarius. Okay. But we can look that one up. Yes, Cassiopeia A was the I think Cassiopeia A. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it was well, just, you know it was it was a combination of both that electrical short, which knocked out the two controllers, which actually turned out to be a good thing, because if if the controllers had been working right, it they would have been trying to pump more gas into the uh, the engine, and it probably would have caused a bigger problem than um, than than actually occurred. So it actually turned out to be two opposing types of errors that canceled each other out. But what what was Eileen mentioned in the uh, in her last training run before the mission, uh, they had a, a, a spare time to to throw an extra malfunction simulation at them. So they threw a, a a, a uh, AC1 phase uh, phase A failure at them and a and an engine uh, controller failure, and so they actually had as their last sim the very thing that happened to them on on ascent. Yeah, that was an incredible that was an incredible coincidence. People couldn't even believe it. Of all the things they could have picked on the fly, and again this was maybe a week before the launch, of all the things they could have picked, they picked AC1 phase A, and that yeah. happened to be what failed on the actual launch. So, I mean, there, there's probably thousands of malfunctions they could have picked and they picked that one. So coincidence. It, yeah, very fortuitous all the way down the road. I, I was thinking, could you have possibly shut that engine off if you, you know, in time and, and cycle the fuel through the other engines to, to get the Delta V required? Yes, we could have, we, yes, we could have shut the engine down and those are different simulations that we practice, you know, if we had some kind of a major leak out of that engine, um, and I can't remember exactly where, you know, what that cutoff would be. Again, the crew doesn't have insight into that. So that would be a call from mission control. They would call us and say, we need to have you shut down 
you know, center, uh, center, left, right at, and then they would give us a, normally not an altitude, but they would give us a velocity, um, you know, which, which would be what a VI, which is an inertial velocity at this point, shut this engine down. And we would do that using a push button in the cockpit. But I don't think the leak was big enough to, but, but if it was, that would certainly be an option. Well, I mean, I, and again, that, that goes back to you talking about this being a very heavy payload as well. If you had shut an engine down, you, you are suddenly in a, maybe a, a not potentially survivable situation coming back, back to mm. Earth. Again. Wow. Yep. That's right. And, you, you shut down one engine, the other two are going to have to burn longer. And then you might be in an abort situation. Wow. Everything was right to the, the thinnest margins, right? And were you saying if one more, uh, one more of the cooling tubes would have been ripped that that could have destroyed the engine? One or two, you'd have a bigger leak. Yeah. And, you know, if, if the leak was, if the leak was bigger, you know, would they have, I, I, no one actually debriefed me that they would have me shut the engine down as we talked about this after the fact. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I wish I could give you the answer to that, but I, we're going back 20 years. So I hate yeah. to say anything because it might be, I may not be saying it right, but I, I do know that there were other options that could have been done if the leak was bigger. Mm, wow. We're getting quite a few questions from our audience. Should we uh, take a look here? Uh, we have from uh, Beckett Potter. Uh, she met with, uh, or I'm not sure he or she met with Wally Funk earlier today and she had a copy of your book. She wanted to tell uh, Colonel Collins, say hi. I, I wanna ask uh, Colonel Collins, what most inspired her to pursue a career in space? And what, well, we kind of covered that already. And what advice would you give to someone interested in filling her space boots? <laughs> yeah, so, well, first of all, Wally is a friend of mine. You know, she flew on Blue Origin last summer. It was July 20th. They actually launched on the anniversary of the moon landing. And I've been friends with Wally for years. I got to know her back when I first met the Mercury 13. You know, she was one of the Mercury 13 women. She was the youngest. And I, I thought it was uh, just wonderful that Blue Origin invited her to, to fly. So she finally got her space flight that she was trying to do for so many years. And I know she, Wally wants to go up again. So that's, you know, I can't blame her for that. Um, what advice would I give, um, you know, to somebody that, you know, wants to be an astronaut today and say, fill my shoes, but um, the future is going to be a lot different from the past. So um, I would say if you are interested in being an astronaut, whether you're you know, a young woman or a young man, I would say, take a look at the NASA requirements. They're online. And when you apply, you apply online and you apply directly to NASA, unless you're in the military. If you're in the military, you have to apply to your military service. They have a board and then they send those who are selected forward. But, you know, I would say, you know, it's always important to, to do something, you know, you're good at something that you enjoy to be an astronaut. You need a degree in science, engineering, uh, math also qualifies. I'm a math major um, to show that you have the skills that are important for spaceflight. And for the shuttle program, we also hired medical doctors. But I think for the deep space missions that are coming up, if you have a degree in engineering, that is a big plus, probably any kind of engineering. Or if you have a degree in geology, I think that's a big plus because we're going to be actually exploring the surface of the moon and hopefully eventually going to Mars. If you could find a, a person with a degree in both of those, that would be, I would think, almost a definite interview um, because you have the skills that are needed. Um, so go, take a look at the requirements. I think it says you only need like three years of related uh, experience working in the degree that, that you chose. And they've recently changed the requirements to say you must have a master's degree. So that that wasn't true ever until this last round. And I'm not sure why NASA increased it to master's, but I think it may be they were just getting too many applicants, and mm -hmm. they were having and they were only selecting people with advanced degrees anyway. So, um, and again, that's just me talking. I don't know the reason that they did that, but now you have to have an advanced degree, which, by the way, the year spent would qualify towards your work areas. And then I would say the other things is it's important that astronauts 
can get along with other people because you're going to be together in a very small environment for a long period of time. You want people you can get along with. You, you don't want people who are grouchy or who, you know, who knows, you know, start, don't talk or act weird or something. I mean, you got, you want to be with people that are mission oriented, that can communicate, uh, that can maybe do well in isolated environments and, you know, have a good stable, uh, I want to say platform to work from. So NASA tries to uh, hire people like that. That one's a little bit harder to evaluate because there's no quantitative way to evaluate that really. It's more qualitative, um, but get experience working with people and, you know, being in, uh, you know, I mean, you, you could do that with community uh, activities, you know, I mean, you name it, just, you know, church activities that you've shown some leadership. And then the other one is we have a language that's helpful to one of the languages of the space program. And if you have, can show that you uh, can in, maybe operate in an a enclosed environment, maybe you have a scuba certification, or maybe you have a, you've soloed an airplane, or maybe you have a pilot's license. All of those things I just mentioned might give you a little extra like icing on the cake. Hmm. So um, I would say for the, for, is, you know, if I was going, if I was a young person and I wanted to be an astronaut, I would, I would go get a degree in geology or engineering. And the other thing I didn't mention, and then I'll be done, is know how to fix things. It is very important that astronauts know how to fix things when they break. And when we do training for this, you can tell when you watch the crew members go through training, some people are really good at fixing things. They just sort of know what to do. And I think that's, and some people don't know anything about it, but, but frankly, that's, yeah, I mean, if you're 220,000 miles away on the surface of the moon, you can't call the fix-it man. You're going to have to do it yourself. So those are skills like, you know, shop class that we, I don't know what they call it today, but when I went to high school, they called it shop class and they taught you how to do plumbing and electricity and fix cars. All that is very important. And women can do that. Um, traditionally, men do that but women can do that too. So that's yeah. my answer. <laughs> cool. Don, Don Pettit's, uh, astronaut Don Pettit saying another thing to look at was if they could look at somebody's garage or the trunk of their car, you'd get a feel for whether they were qualified to be on the, uh, the ISS for a long time because you have a lot of things that you have to keep organized and, and be able to track down and know where they are. Yeah. Very true. Well, uh, I think nowadays it's what sh what is shop classes I'll call career technical ed, and uh, those programs are still pretty strong. And it's you know sometimes it, not everybody's geared for college, so you got to wonder in the future there's going to be a massive demand, especially as Starship starts to uh, take flight, and having people those technical skills and being able to you know fix things on the spot. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I think the horizons are going to expand dramatically. Uh, another question here is along your, uh, this is from David Chudwin, and he is asking along the course of your career, was your plan, what was your plan B if you were not able to advance to the Air Force test pilot school, if you were not chosen as an astronaut, et cetera? So you always have to have a plan B is what I say. I always have something to fall back on. Um, you know, even today with, you know, what I do today, I have something to fall back on um, in case, you know, things go in a direction you don't predict. But for me, I actually had uh, coming out of test pilot school, I would have gone to, had I not gone to the astronaut program, I would have gone to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and I would have done some type of uh, flight test up there and then possibly come back to Edwards Air Force Base and flight test on the C-17. So the C-17 was the replacement for the C-141, which was my operational airplane. And I even had a fallback plan when I graduated from college. I was uh, going to be what they called a computer systems design engineer. That was the name of my job back uh, that I was going to have in the Air Force. But then I got selected for pilot training, so I went and did that instead. Um, if I was... Uh, not eligible to be a pilot in the Air Force because my eyesight maybe. I mean, I had a lot of trouble with the eye exam as I talked about in the book. It was the eye exam that many different areas could have kept me for, kept me out of the flying world. 
I was 20, 25 in one eye. That's how tight the requirement. I had to be 20, 20 in both eyes. So um, I was able to get down to 20, 20 by eating a lot of carrots. Really? And, oh, I, I was a senior in college. I ate so many carrots that the, my fingertips turned orange. It really happens. I ate two weeks carrots every day and my both hands, my fingertips turned orange. It was incredible. I way overdid it, but it must've worked because I got 20, 20 on when I, when they sent me back, I flunked my eye exam the first time they sent me back after the carrots and I passed the second wow. time. So someone told me carrots were good for your eyesight. I don't even know if that's true or not, but that sounds like it. <laughs> but it worked. So the other thing, but you know, fallback for me, I always wanted to be a math teacher. And I was fortunate that I taught math for three years at the Air Force Academy in the middle of my career. And I was a student teacher for sixth graders back when I was in high school, uh, senior in high school. I student taught sixth graders and I learned a lot in that job. That it, teachers have a very hard job. But I've, I've always thought it could fall back to being a math teacher, which is something I love doing. Hmm, yeah. Uh, also, people are asking, uh, are you going to be uh, going on tour and doing some book signings, you and Jonathan? Yeah, so Jonathan's going to help me out with this answer here. Um, yeah. I Okay, so COVID is still going on. So some people don't want book signings. And I'm, I've been told this and that. But I am doing, I'm, try, I'm doing one up in Syracuse, uh, which is my alma mater, my college. I'm, I'm trying to set one up right now in Houston. And I want to eventually set one up in my hometown, though that'll be a little bit farther down the road. I'm going to wait because they have a big COVID surge up there right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to be respectful of, you know, the rules in the area. So uh, those are the ones I have. And Jonathan, you may, he might know some that I am not remembering right now, but here's my feeling on the, on the book signings. I, I, they don't all have to be done like within the month of the book release. I can still do those um, a little bit farther down the line, but the event that I'm doing here right now, I find that there's a big interest near the release of the book. So I'm trying to do as many of these type events uh, early on because they do reach a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're both thinking about you know, after uh, after the beginning of the next year that uh, hopefully things will have gotten a little bit better and then we'll be able to get out and do things. We would love to be able to go to the uh, like the National Air and Space Museum or the uh, California Science Center, uh, the Intrepid Museum, places like that. I think would be natural to be able to go out and meet a lot of people and 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 do this kind of thing. So we are definitely looking at doing that. It's just it's not going to be in the next month or two for sure. Yeah. Well, our, our conference will be Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we'll be in Arlington, Virginia, the International Space Development Conference. We're certainly hoping that that somehow falls on, on the tour circuit, you know, and uh, we'd love to have you there. We've done a lot of book signings in the past. In fact, uh, when Buzz Aldrin wrote his Mission to Mars book, I ordered two pallets full of books. And yeah, we went through, we sold about 400 of them, which was remarkable, but... Uh, was this the sister Great. that I said we we're going to sell two thousand of them? Wow! You know, hey. that's a lot of books to sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Buzz would his arm would have fell off by the end of the day. Um, let's see, what else do we have for questions here? Um, this is from Angela Groves, and she's she's asking, pre NASA, did you ever struggle with self doubt? If so, how did you overcome it? My answer is all the time. I mean, I would be lying if I said no. So self-doubt is, is, is human nature and everybody has it. I think we have it to different degrees. I, I will say, first of all, you've gotta be rested and you've gotta be eating right and you've, you've gotta be exercising and taking care of yourself because if you don't do those things, you're just gonna have a lot of self-doubt. You know, I think, um, I think having a good physical, uh, good physical health is really good for your uh, mental attitude to have a, a very positive mental attitude. So I've had self-doubt. Oh my gosh. I was really shy as a kid. I was afraid to speak up for, you know, you name it, all kinds of reasons. And I never thought I was good enough. I didn't, you know, think that I matched up to all the kids in school, you know, they were all popular and I was kind of a wallflower. So, you know, I went all through school with the shyness and self, and it was kind of painful to be honest with you. 
But when I joined the Air Force, I started changing. I think the Air Force gave me a sense of confidence. And I think this happens pretty much to everybody. Their, their confidence increases. Um, I think it's just kind of the way the training is designed. And then you're given opportunities to have leadership experiences. And some of those in the training environment are not very risky because if you make a mistake, you just, well, okay, you debrief it and you say, well, I'll do something different next time. So I think, I think when I started flying, that was, uh, it really helped me. I was never very good in sports. I, I, for whatever reason, I didn't think I was very coordinated, you know, playing volleyball or bass, you name it. I, that just wasn't my thing, but I could fly an airplane. When I started flying an airplane, I thought, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I can do this. So I think that kind of helped a little bit, but even as an adult, you know, you have self doubts. And I think the way I deal with that is I just go, that's human nature. I have self doubts. Everybody has it. Just keep going. Just, you can go mechanical, which is what I'll do. So you don't want to live on your emotions all the time because huh, that's pretty draining. So, you know, I like to use checklists. I, I always go around with a to-do list and, you know, if I'm having a bad day and maybe I'm, you know, having some self-doubt, I go to my checklist and I'll just do some stuff. So, and then, you know, I mean, it's just life. So, yep. I still what, have uh, self-doubts. <laughs> one of my yeah, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a pilot with self-doubt over one that's overconfident every day of the week. Yeah. yeah and, you know, that's a good safety check too. You're yeah. right about that. One of, one of my favorite stories in the book is about when Eileen got invited to the White House to meet President Clinton when they were going to make the announcement of her being the commander of STS-93. And she talks about having, you know, met with, her pre with, with the president and, you know, relaxed nicely in the Oval Office and then walks across the hallway to the Roosevelt Room and opens the door and sees, you know, a wall of TV cameras and Sam Donaldson and the room is packed and Sally Ride sitting in the front row and and, and Eileen just describes it so perfectly. She said, you know, she, she could just feel the sweat starting at the top of her head and pouring down and, and thinking, I can't possibly go in this room. And then she said, she kind of like reframed it. And she said, Eileen's going to have a trouble going in this room, but the commander can do this. And I'm, I'm going to be the commander and just take on that mantle and kind of go in and, and do it that way. And then she was able to, to, to face it that way which I just thought was just an amazing uh, way to kind of reframe a situation like that to realize you do have a sense of control over what's going on. Yeah, yeah. that is true. That is very true. <laughs> it's taking yourself out of the equation, right? And just, yeah, going with a persona. It's amazing how that works. Yeah, fabulous. Um, let me, okay, here's one from Val Phillips. What is your opinion about these fully automated vehicles and having crews without the, the amount of training and professional astronauts in general, I guess. Yeah, so I think if, if you want to do tourism in space, you know, commercial space flight at a higher rate, get more people in space that are not professional astronauts, you've got to automate the spacecraft. So I believe that automation of spacecraft is a good thing. And I think it will, it, it, there is a certain degree of safety. It just, the fact that you have it automated, but it's got to be tested. If it's not fully tested, the automation can really be a problem. But if, if the automation is as simple as possible, you don't want to have complicated software with, you know, the, the, you can't really test it very well, but you want to have simple software, simple mission, um, automate it. So take Blue Origin, for example, the fully automated uh, New Shepard rocket. Um, I can't speak for its safety because I don't work for them. Um, but I, I will say the benefit is you can get more people in space because you don't need to train them. You, I mean, you give them the basic safety training. They don't need to be trained how to fly or how to throw switches or how to run procedures. They need training, you know, for example, if there's a fire or, you know, if they have to do a quick egress, you know, how do I get out of my seat fast and get out of this spacecraft? So there's certain training they need to do, but you know, I believe that we need to get more people into space. And the more people we get into space, the more I think they will have an appreciation for the importance of space flight and the importance of, you know, just taking care of the earth, you know, looking back at the earth and seeing how thin the atmosphere is and seeing that, yes, we do live on a sphere. We, we do not live on a flat earth. Some people still ask me about that, um, but we do live on a sphere with a 
teeny tiny little atmosphere that's, you know, we say like an eggshell on an egg. And, you know, William Shatner's flight, I thought, and I really loved what he said, because I think his, the emotion that he had um, in the way he was able to articulate the experience he had was, was perfect. I, I just loved it. In fact, I saved it. I played it over, over and over again, <laughs> just to kind of try to understand, you know, how he felt. I loved it when he said he didn't want, I forgot how he put it, but it was something like, I don't want to forget what happened. And that's what happened to me on my first launch. I just wanted to, when I went to bed that night, I kept running the launch over and over in my head because I never wanted to forget it. It was such a crazy experience. And, but I was lucky to go out and do more. But so I think the automation is good because we'll get more people flying. Um, I am worried a little bit about the safety. So I, I'm supporting commercial space flight. I think they're doing a good job right now. But if they do not learn, uh, if they do not teach themselves and really learn of the problems that caused the Challenger and Columbia shuttle accidents, then we could have another accident. So it's very important for those companies to study the lessons learned from the shuttle program where we made mistakes and we killed two crews. Because a lot of those, they, they weren't all technical reasons. A lot of them were just bad decisions or they were organizational problems that can happen anywhere. And you study, you go, wow, those are problems that could happen in my family, you know, not just within a company. So, you know, things like listening to each other and, you know, the, I won't go into that right now, but um, I'm very supportive of the commercial space flight. They've got to do it safely. And you know, I mean, if I ever see, you know, I, again, I'm not working with any of those companies, but if, if I saw something that I thought was unsafe, I would speak up about it. Yeah, definitely. So Barbara Harris wants to know if you had the opportunity to fly to space again, would you do it? Yes, I would. Um, I would love to go to the moon. Yeah, me um, too. You know, I really would. I, you know, forget all the peripheral stuff. I mean, just to do, to do the, um, the actual mission of flying to the moon. And, you know, I, I think I'm a very mission oriented person and I like the strategy of setting up the plan of a mission and then studying, like, if this malfunction happens, what will I do? Will I go this direction? Da, da, da. And then I go out and execute the mission. And, you know, to have that experience of walking on the moon, I think that would be great. Um, I'm not sure if I would go on one of the uh, suborbital space flights at this point in my life. I'm not really sure if I would do that. If, if someone asked me to do that, I would have to go study the spacecraft and I would, I have a kind of a risk management way I think of things. And I would kind of run some of those through my mind, um, ask those kind of questions, talk to the people that built the spacecraft that maintain it, that operate it and make my own decision from there. Um, you know, from my point of view as a test pilot. So I would not have gotten into the space shuttle if I didn't think it was safe. And especially my last mission, which was after the Columbia accident, I told my crew, we are not going to fly this return to flight mission unless every single problem that we're concerned about is fixed. And the shuttle program did that. And when we flew, I felt very confident that we were going to have a safe mission. So that's my answer. You know, one of the things that that uh, I, I think about with the commercial crew or with commercial crew or with the space tourism is, again, thinking about the sense of mission. You know, with Eileen flying the space shuttle return to flight, this was an important thing to be able to prove that the space shuttle could fly again. We had to have it to be able to complete the International Space Station. There was a very strong national imperative to that. And one of the things that I really like about the way uh, Eileen opened up in this book was she's talking about how do you explain to your family about the risk that you're going to be taking? Uh, you know, one of the things we, that you know, it was kind of like the unspoken thing that I, I'd never really heard before was that as the families are watching the space shuttle take off, um, everybody is thinking about Challenger and nobody is saying a word about it, but it, it's, it's still going through everybody's mind. And so the same thing, if you were gonna, if you were gonna plop down a quarter million dollars of your family's money and potentially not come back home to your wife and your kids, how would you explain to them that that was a worthwhile use of your time and money? 
And, you know, it, and it may be for some people, but I think that's something you need to figure into the equation. What's this going to do to your family when they see you get on that ship? I, I, we heard this after the Inspiration4 mission. One of the, uh, the crewman's uh, wife said, I never want to go through this again. Hmm. Oh, really? I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Well, you look at the progress that's happening right now. It, do, you, do you see it uh, feasible to have uh, space tourism to the moon in 20 years? I mean, I'm the eternal optimist. I think it's going to happen, and I'm saving a, a few nickels on the side just in case. But you know, this there we're at a tipping point right now where things are really happening fast. So I, I just I wonder, maybe we could get that uh, mission to them, or you know that that flight to the moon, 20 years. Do you, do you think that's a strong possibility? Oh, I do. I, I definitely do. I mean, right? Isn't I? I have to maybe somebody can correct me, but it, isn't there a crew that is supposed to fly on a SpaceX spacecraft uh, and circle to orbit the moon and come back? I think something like that is, they're not going to land, they were just going to orbit, but I think something like that is in the plans. I, I mean, I think SpaceX has shown that they can achieve, that it always takes longer than they say, but I think that we we did it back in 1969 through 1972. So it can be done. I mean, the biggest barrier is really the money, you know, ha having the money to develop these spacecraft and test them and make them safe. And if, if one of these commercial companies has an accident, um, there's going to be a big stop sign going up there and yeah. they're not going to fly again for a long time. And they're going to have to rebuild their reputation. So they don't want to have an accident. But but I do think 20 years, I would, if you asked me how many years, I would not be able to give you an answer. But I, I would think they could do it in 20 years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it as well. Well, we're, um, Bert, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're good if we, if our guests would like to go to about 1030. That's the Eastern time, so. Um, I'm good, I'll, I'll try to make short answers and <laughs> okay, well, get more questions you know, I, in there. It, we're we're quality, not quantity, so not, not, no worries on that. I wanted to, I wanted to, I saw one question that popped up about, um, you know, had Eileen, uh, you know, having grown up in, in Elmira, <laughs> did she have an experience with sailplanes? And this was one of the pictures from the book. This is Eileen in, uh, you were what, about 12 years old in this picture? Yeah, it looks like I'm probably about 12. There's, you can see the sailplane in the background. Ah, okay. That's my family. That's the four of my siblings right there. That would have been did, maybe 1968, 1969, maybe. Did you get to fly the sailplane? No, no, my family had no money. We There was no way I was going to get to fly in a sailplane. But I actually got my sailplane license uh, many years later when I was in the Air Force out in, uh, I was flying C-141s at Travis Air Force Base and Vacaville nearby had a glider port. So I went out and got my sailplane license. I, I will tell you the scare, the most scared I've ever been in an airplane was flying a sailplane solo. I was ridge soaring out there at Vacaville and I went too far and I'm coming along the ridge and there's trees everywhere. And I didn't think I was going to make it back to the runway and I was going to crash in the trees. And all I did was pray, you know, God, please get me through this. And I promise you, I'll never do it again. <laughs> I will always stay close to my base, but I made it back and I landed. Well, that was, that was pretty scary. That when I was interviewing to be an astronaut, John, John Young asked me in the interview if I had ever been scared in an airplane. And the only thing I could say was, which time do you want to hear about? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but that, that was one. But, you know, I'm um, very, very, uh, I, I really enjoy flying gliders. They're very quiet and they're like the closest thing to, to being a bird. I mean, if you want to imagine yourself flying like a bird, you know, it's, the closest thing to it because it's so quick there's no engines you know it's just very quiet and you got beautiful view out the cockpit so it's it's pretty cool but you gotta you gotta be safe can't take those chances i was maybe just too young and stupid <laughs> well hey you have to be on the edge right to, to get that experience and that wasn't yeah. the most flattering picture of me but we put it in the book anyway because you know it it kind of fit with the story I can relate to your brother's haircut. I think I run very similar to that. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Patty Decker would like, uh, so she's wondering how Bridget and Luke are doing. Is there anything you can share with us? Yeah, so hi, Patty. So I, yeah, I have two children and, uh, you know, they're, they're growing up, they're, they're doing good. And, you know, I do, I do want to say, you know, people always ask me about being a mother and being an astronaut. I thought that um, the astronaut office was really supportive of those astronauts that were mothers and frankly, fathers too. I think the astronaut office for parents overall was very supportive. And a lot of it is really who you're working for. So when I was commander, um, I made sure that my crew had spent time with their families. I tried not to work my crew, you know, every single waking hour. I tried, it been, I think I had both times I was commander, I had the luxury uh, because of launch delays. I had the luxury of letting my crew members go home at five o'clock um, because the launch delayed, we could spread out our training. But for the most part, astronauts work very, very hard. And when you're raising kids, um, it's, it's important that you, you, you want to let your kids know that, you know, you love them and you want to spend time with them. And I would come home and, you know, read books, depending on the age that they're at, you know, read books to them, take them for walks, you know, take them to the park, just, you know, spend time with them. And uh, in, that's a challenge for the astronauts, but I think it's, it's something that I always try to put as a priority. Um, I had my own kids, and so I was sensitive to the other people that I worked with, that they had time with their families. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be kind of tear at you your know, heart. Let me say one other thing about that. When the accident happened, I thought it was because I knew that, you know, we were going to be the return to flight and the families were going to be worried so I tried to set up events for the crews for the spouses and the children to get together you know we had them come out and do a simulator we had them come to the neutral buoyancy lab and watch us train there you know we'd have parties at each other's house and to make sure the kids got to know each other so when they went down you know my kids would know like my pilot was Jim Kelly you know he had four kids and you know to make sure that my kids and the, the rest of the children on the uh, mission knew each other and so they could support each other during the launch so I tried to put a priority on families well not only that you gave them an opportunity to, to share the experience of what you do on the job and they could relate to it better do do your kids have aspirations for uh, going nope. into NASA? no 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 nope, I think they had enough of mom doing her thing they were <laughs> nope they're doing other things neither one of them want to join the military or fly but but that's their choice i'm okay with that yeah yeah they're gonna find their own way that's cool uh, so carl uh is asking has your experience in space changed your outlook on life in general yes yes it has very much and it was my first mission so I, I don't know what it was, but maybe it was because I achieved my dream and I had been in space, the, you know, the first time, or maybe it was just having that um, experience of looking back at the earth. I think I was a lot less stressed out after I came back from my first mission. You know, before my flight, I was always, you know, hurry, 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 get as much done as you can, be as efficient as you can, don't waste a second of the day. And, you know, work, work, work. When I went on vacation, I was like, oh, I'm wasting time on vacation. I need to be doing something. And, but when I came back from my flight, I was like, you know, there's more to life. You know, you ought to just like read a book or take some, you know, take some time to relax. I remember I had a friend one time that said, oh, let's relax. And I went, relax, who does that? <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> we need to work some more. But so I, I think I really just became, I, I would say more of a human being kind of person after I, if, and I liked, and I've told Jonathan this story before I remember, so I don't like it when people cut in front of me on the highway. I just, I think it's rude to like cut in front of somebody. You almost like, you almost have an accident when someone cuts in front of you. So I was driving into work after I came back from my first space flight and I'm, I'm driving in and somebody cut in front of me. And normally I would think, oh, what a jerk. But this time I thought, I don't care. I step on the brake and give them more room. You know, and I, I think I'm, I'm more like that now. I'm, I'm just more like, why get upset about stuff? That's just, it. honestly, it is not important. It's not so important. So do you think it was because you reached that, that, that ultimate goal that uh, you've had more satisfaction in life, you weren't so driven that you had to uh, 
you know, keep that, not allow yourself to enjoy time off and things like that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, when, when I was in the Air Force, it was always, what am I going to do next? You know, I get as many flying hours as possible, sign up for as many, you know, I go, how am I going to get my master's degree? I got my first master's, how am I going to get my second master's degree? And then it was like, how am I going to get in test pilot school and take some more courses in this area? So, da, da, da. you know, I was always working and, you know, doing something more. And, uh, you know, I think there's room for some of that. And, but it, you don't want it to be all encompassing. You want to be able to enjoy life to read a book, go see a movie, take vacation. I mean, those are all part of a balanced life. And we all have to make decisions on balance our work life with our personal life. So, you know, it's hard on people today because now you have social media and you got to, you know, we spend time on TikTok and we're, we got to, you know, post our LinkedIn or post our Instagram photo. And so there's even more demand on people today because I think for some of us, there's expectations to do these things. Um, I quit Twitter because... I just, it was just too much. Maybe someday, I'll, maybe someday I'll go back, but um, I think you just have to make, you don't have to do it all. So yeah. I'm getting philosophical here, but that's enough. <laughs> well, speaking of philosophical, Alexa Smith is asking, where do you see the future of the arts in space? Oh, the arts in space? Oh, I would love to see more art, in, not in space, but on earth. I would love to see more um, artists just create the beauty of the universe. And I love space art. So I remember, I don't know if many of you remember Kim Poor, he was a yeah. space artist who I personally knew because he started up Space Fest and I've been there a couple of times. And I remember looking at the artwork that his, um, he would have the artists bring their work in and I would get their catalog and they would look at their website. And I think, I mean, when you look at like the Hubble Space Telescope images, that's like art. It, it, I mean, it, it really is. It's it's beautiful, and I love the uh, um, the imaginations of artists and the landscapes where they imagine what other planets would look like if you were on the surface. So I think I, I really wish we had more space artists. I think the ones that are out there are really good. Um, I think they're. I would really like to see space art get a wider distribution, and more people could enjoy it share it and enjoy i don't know jonathan what do you think about that oh absolutely no i i i the same way i just one of the things i think is great about the for example the mars rovers and things like that is that it does give us that perspective of standing on another planet and looking at if we could be there and, and look at it with our own eyes we could see that and i think that's what what the artists are able to do and uh uh it it, it is just a fantastic uh kind of thing to do i mean nicole stott uh did some uh was the first person to do watercolors on the space station and she's got some amazing art and was able to capture that as alan bean did when he came back after his apollo missions and his space uh, his uh, skylab mission to to become a full-time artist to be able to to then you know go beyond what the photographs show you and and then kind of turn it more into a human experience yeah and i love like you people use the artists we use their imagination you know and and, uh, you know, what, what do you think it might look like? So um, I would like, I would like to see more space art out there in the, I would say the general public so they can share it and enjoy it too. Uh, a lot of people at uh, NASA, well, for instance, Rob Manning is uh, the chief engineer for um, Perseverance. And he's also um, an accomplished jazz saxophone player. So he has that at artist side of his brain fully activated as well as being a phenomenal engineer. So I wonder, do you see many people in the astronaut corps that are, you know, yeah, it's like uh, Alan Bean is a, an accomplished artist and Nicole Stott as well. So um, yeah. It's yeah and Michael, Michael Collins was also, was also an artist. And on the music side, the astronaut office, I don't know if they still do, but they had a band back in the shuttle program it was called max q you know yeah. q for dynamic pressure maximum dynamic pressure and so really pretty talented people you know my commander jim weatherby was the drummer and then you had to hoot gibson and kevin chilton were guitar players and uh tracy caldwell joined the band and she was a singer and i'm 
trying to remember, but the various astronauts would rotate in and out of the band. So they did ask me in my interview if I played an instrument and I didn't want to lie. I've tried, but I'm not that level. But there are many astronauts who are multi-talented who've taken their instruments. Well, Katie Coleman, I flew with Katie Coleman on my third flight. And uh, I'm trying to remember some of the others, Susan Helms. I mean, they play, uh, she plays keyboards. So we have quite a few talented astronauts. Yeah, absolutely. And flight controllers and engineers and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, I saw Max Q at the International Space Development Conference in Huntsville in 2011. And uh, Max Q actually did a performance there, which was pretty inspiring. I was, and it was in this little hotel room suite that was kind of like a, an underground movement, but uh, you know, got to experience some of their, their talent. It was very cool. We're at the 9.30 mark, so um, wow, we could go on. Uh, well, one last question. This is from Jackie Sturgis. For those teens who do not necessarily want to be astronauts, but are interested in finding careers in the aerospace industry, does Colonel Collins have any suggestions and or advice? Well, I would say, first of all, get a degree in STEM. Uh, well, first of all, if you're in high school, take math and science every semester, every year. Don't skip math for a year. Just take it and, and you know, whatever you take, if you want to take statistics or something along, take some kind of math. And then in your college years, get, you know, find out, you know, look at all the STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, and math, and pick something you like and go into that field. And there'll be room for you in the space program. Our country is in desperate need of engineers. We need people that, that can do cyber type uh, jobs, computer skills. Um, in, in fact, there's, I think there's two bills in Congress right now to uh, give money to scholarships to college students to get degrees in cyber security and then go work in the Department of Defense. Um, there's a big need for that. So uh, the other advice I would say is if you happen to be the only woman in the class, don't quit the class. You know, I mean, you can just stay and, you know, do the, the best job that you can do. And I think that you will find that you're a role model for other women to follow. So a lot, I see a lot of women, you know, quit engineering or maybe drop out of a class because, you know, they don't, they don't fit in, or maybe they didn't get an A or something. I would just say, you know, stick to it. Um, the space program needs all types of degrees, you know, whether you're interested in a certain type of science, earth science, space science, or you want to do a type of uh, engineering, um, you will be in demand by companies if you have STEM skills. I know, Jonathan, can you think of anything there that, that that's in a very important question? I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Absolutely. I was just thinking about my nephew who um, got a got an engineering degree from Embry-Riddle, and he went on to become uh, one of the trainers on the robot arm for the ISS. And now he's working on the, he was working on the Landsat program for a while, and now he's working on uh, another uh, uh, uh payload that's on the International Space Station. So there's lots of ways to be involved in the space program without actually flying. And the other thing, if you, I have had, for example, I know a lady who hires for a bank and she told me I will hire an engineer in a minute. And I said, really, why would you hire an engineer to work at a bank? And she said, engineers can solve problems and I need problem solvers. And, you know, frankly, that applies to scientists too. You know, because you're taught the scientific method, and he works, you know, all of these things, science, math is problem solving, engineering is prob designing, solving problems. So I think th those are actually good life skills because the, the skills that you learn in those STEM degrees to solve problems carry over into your life. So um, I would say, go for it. Don't give up. Don't have to get an A's and everything. Just make sure that you learn. And you want to do something you enjoy also. Yeah, I've got to give a little pitch for STEAM for the arts too, to have that, that other side of the brain activated and for creativity as well, because that's so essential. Exactly. Well, Eileen and Jonathan, this has been a fantastic evening. We're going to be able to run this on YouTube uh, probably in the next day or two. We'll get links out to all the people that missed this, but we had a pretty decent turnout tonight. Some excellent questions. 
We we are NSS so appreciate your contribution. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get my copy. I I wonder if Amazon's running out of inventory right now. That would be a great thing. I don't know. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll check into it. We'll get you a book, Dave. We'll make sure you get oh, one. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Bert, we're back and uh, Thank take you, it Bert. away. Thanks so much. And uh, I would like to give a shout out to that last question. Uh, it's from my uh, Civil Air Patrol. It came from my Civil Air Patrol colleague, actually Lieutenant Colonel Jackie Sturgis, and also a member of the 99. So uh, a very appropriate question. So uh, and well, again, uh, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Jonathan, for just a fascinating, fun, informative discussion. Uh, I think we could have go on. We could go on for the rest of the night. <laughs> uh, I don't think I, the comments that came in, the questions, as you said, Dave, were all great. So we really appreciate uh, you coming out and uh, taking the time and sharing your stories and talking about the book. Wishing you much success with that. Dave, thank you for hosting and moderating this night. I know it's, a, it's always a challenge uh, juggling all the different questions and we really appreciate uh, uh, the effort and we'd all we'd welcome you back as a moderator sometime too. <laughs> oh, thank you. And also I'd just like to thank uh, our uh, CEO, Anita Gale and our NSS president, uh, Michelle Hanlon for joining us and doing those great inspirational welcomes. And I always like to thank uh, Fred Becker for his work in supporting all the IT behind the scenes. And of course, my co great colleague, Larry Ahern, uh, uh, for helping and getting all these things organized. We have a great series and we thank everybody for doing that. So I just wanna close out with a, a couple quick things. I know we still have quite a few people on. I'm gonna share my screen again, real quick, everybody. Uh, so, oops, there we go. There. And uh, uh, we did offer uh, four copies of uh, Eileen and Jonathan's book uh, to four of our attendees. And uh, what I did is I used a random number generator uh, and uh, come up with our four winners, uh, Beatrice, Jason, Alexa, and John. Uh, so I will be reaching out to you uh, so we can get you your copies of the book. Congratulations uh, for doing that. And I'm sure you are going to enjoy the, the book as well. So for everybody, I again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Look forward to our next session. Uh, be on the lookout for our next invitations uh, for our session next week and the one on the, uh, the fourth. Uh, so we're, we've got some great programming ahead. Uh, and we're actually doing a lot right now for the programming in 2022. So we have a lot to look forward to as we continue with our space forums and town halls. So everyone, I wanna thank you for attending tonight. Uh, for those of you who are in this time zones, uh, wishing you a great evening. Some are in the earlier time zones, have a great rest of the day. Uh, and, or in the next time zone, have a great rest of the day as well. And of course, a great weekend. Uh, encouraging everybody to stay safe and we'll see you next time. So thank you so much.